It was my great pleasure to introduce Steve Roberts. I'm looking forward to this because I've never heard of the phrase to learn until now, so I'm sure it'll be fascinating. <laughs> Right, thanks David. Good evening everybody. My name's Steve Roberts. I'm a green badge guide with C Southampton. Uh, I'm a daytime taxi driver, that's my background. Um, C Southampton is a bit of a full-time hobby really. Um, and I'd actually never heard of the Grace Jew myself till three years ago. When we were doing our training, I was handed a mock paper. And uh, somebody had done an essay on the William Soap of the Grass Jewel. So uh, it opened up a whole <coughs> new subject for me. So, uh, William Soap of the Grass Jewel. Soap was born in 1390. Uh, he was born in Winchester, came to Southampton, oh, thanks very much, came to Southampton at the age of 20, and is not quite sure how he became. Uh, Employed so so quickly, but he, he he very quickly climbed up the ladder. Um, he was he must have been well educated. He was the son of a draper, but he must have been a wealthy draper because Soper could read and write, and he had very good administrative skills. So his first job in Southampton was as a sheriff, and he was a assistant to one of the aldermen. Within three years, he was mayor. He was mayor twice. Um, he, his first big job was collector of the king's taxes or the king's customs. Um, he had a whole list of different jobs in his lifetime. I won't list them all because there's such a large amount of them. But there's a huge amount written by written about William Soper because he was such an important man. His letters survive, uh, all his accounts survive at Greenwich. So that's why we know so much about Soper. Uh, this is where. One of Soper's houses was. He had he owned a lot of properties. This is what's known as Canute's Palace in, in Porter's Lane. Um, this was a warehouse up until the Second World War, but this was the also known as the Long House, and this was where the customs were collected um, and all the cargo bought off the ships was brought in, and the customs were assessed inside this building. That's the building before the Second World War. Uh, that, this, is, uh, this is the building in the uh, 1800s, rather. This is from Sir Henry Engerfield's uh, book, uh, uh, it's a, a Walk Through Southampton. And uh, he was a chap who wrongly named it Canute's Palace, because we now know that King Canute was uh, uh, 400 years earlier. So it had nothing to do with Canute. But it's known as Canute's Palace. Uh, so Soper would have lived on the top floor there. Um, it's, it's been described as a very substantial dwelling and downstairs would have been the warehouse where all, all, the, all the cargo was taken into. Uh, here's another, here's a photo of it. This is a, the only photo I've ever seen of the warehouse as it was. It was badly damaged in the blitz uh, and um, so I'm told it wasn't, it, it wasn't extensively damaged and it could have been saved. Um, if I go back to the, other, the first photo, there's not a lot left of it. Um, when it was damp, it was only slightly damaged in the blitz, it still had a lot of medieval tiles on it. Apparently, uh, vandals in the 1950s were seen throwing tiles off the roof, and eventually, because it, because it was left, it, it was just uh, beyond repair. So that's Canute's Palace. When we were training to get our green badge guides, uh, our green badges rather, uh, the, the typical guided walk we did was 12 students go around a guided walk with 12 stops. And all of us hated having to do Canute's Palace because even with the internet and all with, with our note sharing, we struggled to find anything interesting to say about Canute's Palace. There was next, next to nothing about it. But once I learned about William Soper, there's so much you can tell about this place because this is where um, Soper owned most of this area here, the, the land around there. There's the Canute's Palace looking down Porter's Lane towards English Street, or High Street as we know it. Across the road there was the, was the, um, was the Friary. Um, Soper was obsessed with the afterlife. And over at the Friary, he, he'd, um, in his will, he'd made provisions for Mass to be said on the anniversary of his death and his, his wife's death as well. 
Um, he also gave, the, he was a very generous man, he gave them, a, a, he built a couple of shops for the friars, there were a couple of houses he gave to them as well as alms houses. Uh, he also owned a property up in All Saints Ward, which I think he lived in later on. And he also owned the Watergate. This is another place. This is where I think is he had another substantial property known as Isabel's Cellar, which I think was possibly this plot at the bottom of, of High Street on the corner of Porter's Lane. Um, I do know that there was a, um, a, house, a very substantial house owned by Winchester College there in the 1600s, which may have been the same house. So that's a lot of um, bits of uh, Soper's properties. Here's the, the site of the Watergate. Now Soper owned the Watergate. He was given the lease, so, or the, so, the lease was signed over to him as long as he paid for all the repairs. Um, the gate stretched across the road here. It was, it was like the bar, the bar gate, only a lot smaller. So this would have been the town quay. All the ships coming in would have tied up around the town quay here. And the company of porters would have unloaded all the cargo, taken down the porter's lane into a customs house. Um, there was a, the tower you can see there. That was a house that he received rent from. And uh, when, when I researched this before, I found this last will and testament. And there's a story that there was a rent of one red rose a year paid for it, a peppercorn rent. Um, Naomi House, the charity, on, on St. Swithin's Day every year, 24th of June, they lay one red rose. I'll actually do a bouquet nowadays. Um, they keep the ceremony going. But the first time I read about this, it said because women were not allowed to inherit, the house was given to one of the Chamberlain family. The uh, Chamberlain family run right through Southampton's history, and so was married into the Chamberlain family. Um, so the, the Chamberlain family that lived there paid one red rose a year. But I've just recently read that uh, his wife did inherit everything. So all, all the research I've done, there's a lot of conflicting <coughs> stories and, and, and um, different dates of wrong things. But, but there was a rent of one red rose a year paid to live in the tower there. There's a picture of the Watergate from the 1700s. So as you can, see, you can see the tower there, there was the gate going across the road. And also at one time it had um, stone plinths with wooden lions on them, just like up at the bar gate. But I've never seen an image of that. And in fact, there's only, I've only ever seen four images of the water <coughs> gate. There's another one, that's from 1772, that one. Very similar one. And there's a player's silver card <coughs> from the early 20th century. And there's one other image that's, that didn't blow up properly, but it's strange that um, all the landmarks in Southampton, such as the Watergate, the Bargate and St Michael's, all been pictured thousands and thousands of times, um, drawings and sketches and paintings, but <coughs> there's four images of the, of the uh, Watergate exist. This was knocked down in 1804 at the height of Southampton's spa town period to let the traffic through. And, the, and the, the stone was sold for 10 shillings. That's the, that's the tower in, in the early 1900s. It was actually a hotel for a while. Uh, if you look at the, the, the uh, ruins nowadays, you'll, you'll see that it's, uh, it's all the bare stone. Apparently what happened was that this was um, damaged during the blitz and uh, they decided to strip off all the rendering and, uh, and leave the bare stonework. But what I've noticed is it's been completely rebuilt because all this area here, if you look at it today, it's all the same stone and there's, there's no doorway there. So they've almost rebuilt the whole structure. And this is the rear of the castle hotel, there's Porter's Lane there. Um, and it was used as a stable, the, the Canute's house was used as a stable uh, in the early 1900s, <coughs> Jersey cattle. This here is the Waterman's Arms, that was destroyed in the Blitz, that was a hotel that was on the, on the site there. And there's one more photo of the Watergate, and that's in the 1960s, and this is, this is when they, they were taking all the rendering off it. As you can see there, it's almost been completely rebuilt. And this is where the grass was actually built. 
This um, Soper um, became the keeper of the king's ships. Uh, he, Henry V decided to build a navy. We had the Hundred Years' War with the French, and there wasn't a royal navy as such. So Soper was tasked with building ships for the king. And so the, the Grestia was actually built over here, roughly where Enios is, and uh, towed down to Hamble for fitting out. And uh, there's a diver, uh, there's a painting of the grass duo. The Vauxhall was 50 foot high, very high for the time. It's a huge ship, and um, it only ever went on one voyage. It went on a, on a, on a patrol round the Solent, and uh, the crew mutinied and got off at St Helens on the Isle of Wight. There's conflicting stories about why this was, but the, it seems that it was such a huge ship that hadn't, they hadn't built a ship that big before, and the sailors were, just, just didn't think it was going to sail properly. Um, there's a record of the quartermaster, he was uh, William Duke of Dartmouth. Uh, he, through the muster list, or the, the, the crew list, of, uh, the list of people going on board, he threw that in, in the river in disgust. So, uh, so that was the, the grass duel going to the Isle of Wight, crew mutiny. So it was taken back to Hamble, and they cut a mud berth into the bank of the river, and it was laid up there. There was a caretaker employed called Jordan Browning. He was a superintendent down at Hamble. He looked after the ships that were laid up there. Because, of, of course, of the um, Battle of Agincourt in 1415, the, the Hundred Years' War had been won. There was no need for such a big navy anymore. So, so there was, at one point there were 17 ships down at Hamble. This is a um, rundown of the, of the making of the factory. <coughs> Cost £4,000 to build. Two, and thousands of oak trees and beech trees, 38 tonnes of oak, 23 tonnes of iron. They were, it was held together by huge 12 inch nails, thousands of them. 24 anchors. And the, Largest anchor was 17 feet tall, the <coughs> Marie Tinktor. But I also read that that was the anchor of the Holy Ghost, which is another arm of the, the king's ships that's um, up at Hamble. This is where I took this photo of Oyster Key in Hamble. All my research said it was that there was a tower built by Soba, a wooden tower at Oyster Key. But I've since learned it was Oyster Hard, which is at the mouth of the river. Um, they had an iron chain across the river to stop the French and Genoese ships coming in. Uh, the wooden tower was there to protect the, the uh, entrance to the river. They actually found part of the chain in the 1920s apparently. I don't know what happened to it, but they, they did find part of the chain there. Um, so this, this is where all the, all the um, ships were brought. This was a major naval base in Henry V's time, Handel. Now, I mentioned that the, um, the ship going on the patrol came back again, and it was put in the berth there, but also nearby was the Holy Ghost. It was another large ship built by Henry V, uh, for, for Henry V. Um, and it's just further up, there's another, another um, diagram of the, of the Brastia at its berth. The Holy Ghost was a... Was, um, a prize taken at sea. It was um, originally a Spanish ship called the Saint Clair or, or the, the, um, the Santa Clara, two different names have been given. So it was captured, brought back to Hamble and completely rebuilt and renamed the Holy Ghost. Um, and that's up in the mud as well apparently. They're, owned by South, they're now owned by Southampton University, uh, the National Oceanography Centre down at the docks have uh, done a lot of research there. Here's a graphic from 1875. And if you don't think you can see that, the remains of an old Danish war galley recently discovered in the bed of the Hamble River near Southampton. They thought it was a um, Danish galley because of the way it was built. It was a clinker built ship which was um, overlapping planks of wood. The actual grass jaw had three layers. In between it had moss and tar for, for um, water, to make it watertight. So that's why they thought it was a, it was a Danish ship. 
But um, since then, um, Time Team have done a special on it. They they um they put a, a, a special sort of tent around it. It's more like a a framework with a tent that went down. And they tried to pump the water out. They managed to um, excavate uh, the uh, one part of it. There's the uh, the remains of the grass jerk in, in the mud. I don't think it ever gets uncovered as much as that nowadays. It all, um, from what I've seen, this is, this is quite an old picture. It, uh, I don't know if you can actually see as much as that, even when the tide's low. Oh, thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> that went through very quick, I'm, I'm sure. <coughs> I'll just print on my notes because uh, <coughs> back to the water gate again then. So uh, some people may remember, uh, um, I know it's nothing to do with uh, William Soper, but um, there was a, the, the Sun Hotel was on the corner here. And when it was destroyed in the Blitz, there is a story that the Canadian soldiers that um, drank, drank in the pub uh, actually rebuilt the pub overnight. So that's what, if anyone remembers, there's a one-story wooden building there for many years that was uh, built by the Canadians. Uh, I'm really sorry about this. I had this all. Put, I've only been doing it about 20 minutes, haven't I? That, sorry, I've, I'm completely... Do you want to questions, Steve? I think that'd be a good idea, yeah, because that would prompt me to remember some of, the, some of the research I've done. I've got bullet points there, but I've... I've yeah, so has anybody got any questions? <laughs> was there any general, general sort of views on it when it was first built? Because it was a very large ship, very impressive. Yeah, it was... It was um, it was the largest ship ever built at the time, and, and, and there wasn't another ship as big as that for 200 years. So, uh, so that, yeah, so, um, yeah. So, she wouldn't have had a cabin, I believe. But, um, <laughs> they, some of, some of Henry V's ships did have cannon. I, I'm, I can't remember if, if the grass steward did. I know one or two of the, um, other, the Holy Ghost might have done. They, they were just, uh, they had bombards. That one or two of them had, but generally they were. Um, I think it was. A, they, they, I think the Grastu had two hundred arches on it. So that would have been the reason for the high. The reason for the, the high folks for, 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 for the arches, yeah. Um, and another reason that this this big ship was it, um, they could use it for ramming. There, there's um, the Holy Ghost actually that took it that that was a uh, took part in a battle at Havre, the battle at um, Le Havre, and also the siege of Harfleur. And um, they would ram each other, um, and, they, and of course they would then board. They've got grappling hooks. They would they would board each other's ships. Um, so they would ram. They, they would ram each other. They, they would um, go up alongside each other. But but they only had one or two guns. Some of them. Yeah. Any, any more? Mm -hmm. Have you got one well, there? Okay. So I mean they're now in the mud of the Hamble. So what's the grass gear it had its one outing? Was it just? Abandoned? It was yes. I'm glad you've asked that question because that did prompt me to remember something really important. Um, it was left there for twenty. It was about twenty years. It was laid up for. They didn't have any use for it. And as I mentioned before about the, the, the superintendent Jordan Browning, he lived on board the ship. And uh, after it had been there about twenty years, one night it was struck by lightning. And there were three other ships alongside it that um, they didn't burn, but the Grastia burned down to the waterline, and that's what that's why we've got the uh, just the, the um, hull of it left because it, it was burned down to the waterline. And the rumour is that it was Jordan Brown who set the thing alight himself because he'd stolen everything that was worth stolen off the ship, uh, stealing off the ship. So uh, yeah. Um, he could have been hacking away around the nails, pulling out one, one or two nails every time. So, um, and in 20 years of pinching everything, there wasn't a lot left. So, it's said that he possibly set the thing alight himself to um, cover his tracks. And what about the, the Holy Ghost? Did 
And that's there as well. And that's there as well, yeah. I, 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 I think that was just, just left there and eventually it, it, it just sank in the mud and it had been rotten away. So, uh, and that, that was only recently discovered in the, uh, in the 60s, I think the Holy Ghost was discovered. The, the grass was, was, was discovered in uh, 1875, was that print there. Yeah. I know you said that the muster roll was thrown overboard, but what sort of numbers were the crew? Um, Roughly. I think, I'm sure it was 200 archers. The, the crew itself, I'm, I'm, I can't remember the number of crew. Um, no, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember the actual number. Lots. But um, it, the, the ship is about twice the size of other ships of that period, so, so it, yeah, you're thinking about twice the size of a normal crew. Um, and another thing is, I've, ne I've never found out what happened to the crew after they mutinied, because normally you'd be, you'd be, you'd be strung up for, for um, mutinying on a ship, but um, I've, perhaps they let them get away with it because it's such a dangerous ship, they thought, well, wouldn't we, uh, we'd, we'd probably agree with them. Was it the stability that made it dangerous? I think it's that because it was, we, we had the same thing, um, hundreds of years later, we had the, um, the Mary Rose and we had the Vassar in Sweden, Exactly the same thing. They were large ships. They hadn't been sailed before, and on their maiden voyage, they sank. So um, it could have been because it was such a large, large ship. They they just didn't think it would sail. They they thought it would topple over, as, no, as nothing had been built like that before. So this great enterprise by William Soper came to a pretty sad end. What happened to him? He. Uh, he carried on after, um, he still carried on as, as customs officer. He spent a fortune building these ships. As he was keeper of the king's ships, uh, he had to pay out himself first. And um, a lot of these, these wealthy merchants that were um, obliged to build ships for the king or, or provide men, it was all out of their own pocket and they would eventually get some of it back or all of it back. Um, Soper got a lot of his money back through being customs collector of the King, uh, King's customs at Customs House there. So he did get some of his money back. Um, he did write to the King, uh, it would, would have been years after the grass jury was, was there, um, he wanted to be relieved of his duties of Keeper of the King's ships because it was costing too much money. And his excuse was that he wanted to go on a pilgrimage to Lombardy before he was too old, so couldn't be excused from, from uh, his royal duties, but they wouldn't let him off, <laughs> so, so he had to carry on doing it. But um, yeah, it actually cost him a fortune to, do, to build all these ships. Um, and he, he um, had, I mentioned before about his properties, he was a verderer of the New Forest, so he owned a lodge in the New Forest, um, he was in charge of, of, of the King's hunting ground, so that was another one of, his, one of the things that kept him occupied. And he bought properties all over the place. Um, so um, I was just talked to a chap Brian just now, who's done a recent talk on the grass jury. Um, there was a there was a, um, a place name that I couldn't find anywhere. What, what, what was it again? Newtonberry. Newtonberry. I couldn't find anything about this Newtonberry where he had a property. And Brian was saying that um, it's actually between Marchwood and Ealing because he did have he had, he had a place in Ealing. He had a place near Dibden, which I think was his hunting lodge. Um, yeah, and, and, he, and he had this place at, uh, uh, what was it again, Newtonberry? Newtonberry, yeah. Newton Berry, yeah. He actually got over the water that time. He had to tell you. And that's where we, actually we think he retired to Newtonberry. The reason is because he had permission to put a chapel in the building. The only way you get a place to put a chapel in the building is from the Pope. So my current line of research is to try and find out where the records are from right. the church, to find out where the oratory was. So we improved that, we improved that. Yeah. And I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but he was actually, actually buried at the Friary in, in, in English Street. And I, I, um, I know that when they excavated to build uh, Friary House with um, British telecom buildings there, I know they found some bodies, but I've no idea if one of them was William Soper. So perhaps they've got William Soper's body somewhere. But that, that was where, where he was buried anyway, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. yeah also, also related to the New Forest, um, I can understand that was half building large ships there. It's the last bit of overspace. Yeah. Where was the space around here? 
Yeah. Well, then, Seven to order right up. Yeah, just just against the key side. Um, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think they um once the ships started getting bigger, I know they, they um the ships were getting too big to build here, so it's only the smaller ships. So even though the Grastia was big, it it's still quite small compared to the the, the, um, the ships later on. So I know they, they built ships at, um, in Northern on the Itchen for a while, but as the ships got bigger, I was saying with Buckler's Hard, I think, wasn't it? They stopped building there once they were too big for the river. Yeah, so... so, so that, and, and any other questions, anybody? How, how do they know that um, they are specifically the Holy Ghost and the Grastia? Um, the Grastia, they are certain of because of the sheer size of it and because there are so many records, um, Soper's records were so detailed, all, all his, um, he was an administrator, so he was meticulous with his records, and most of them survived. Um, so they just know, because of the sheer size of it, it has to be the grass jerk. Um, as for the Holy Ghost, um, I presume the same thing, I think they've got enough evidence. I can enlighten you on that. Right. For me and Free on Saturday, he said they've done a recent survey last year, They've done a, um, a sort of scan of the area with these quite complicated pieces of machinery. Uh, but the results are not issued yet. He doesn't know what they came up with. This is all done by what um, Steve said about the Oceanographic. It's owned by the, the um, Oceanic University. And the Oceanographic Centre is part of the university, the university. So they've done the survey. But I can't get, I and mean, they are not available yet. So yes, they, they may be, but we won't know until later yeah. this year. This is ground penetrating radar. It, yeah, but it's so no, 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 ground yeah, no, no, I don't quite know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, what's the purpose of the, you say, had a three layered um, um, skin to the hull? What was the purpose of that then? Because you said there was moss between it? Yeah, the, the, normally the clinker built ships were. Just one layer, you'd have one like that, layer after another. The grass jur, they they built the hull first um, with three um, three planks at a time, so it was a thickness of three. The moss and the um, tar in between to make it watertight, and then once they had the hull made, inside they built the framework. Um, they chose some of the trees. They they, they would um, choose. Y-shaped trees and, and carve them out, and they'd get slightly bigger. So that that was the um, framework inside the hole. Um, and as I had on the list there, I think it was uh, I think each tree was one and a half tons that they they, they cut there. And was it altogether? It was about four thousand trees to build the whole thing. So it would be quite a labour-intensive task. Now, what are you going to do? With it? Uh, I don't know that answer to that actually. I don't remember reading that how long it took. Must be recorded. So I don't actually remember reading how long it took to build it. But the sun one that was sent into the pot, I believe I'm right in saying this, quartz wood is actually named for being the wood out of the woodland where they've got a lot of trees to grow the ships. So we might be screwed where the timbers came from. Yeah. Right. Okay, and any more questions? Any more of a comment? Well, I was at school, I learned all about King Fidu and him removing the weight, but I didn't know it about that up there, it was all happening at Southampton. Yeah, that's Hen Engelfield, uh, he, he wrongly said it was uh, at Queen's Palace. He, he said it actually happened here because the, um, that would do. The palace actually opened before the, um, this part of the wall was built, so, so the, um, the River Tess would have been around here. But um, of course, if, further down in Canute Road, you've got the Canute's Castle Hotel. And above, on, on, on the, one of the window sills, I think it says 1017 or 1015, uh, that is believed to have happened there. But also, if you ever go to Bosom, uh, um, one of my taxi passengers who lives in Bosom was telling me they, they've got a brass plaque on their harbour wall saying this is where King Canute commanded the way to go back. So, uh, yeah. That's a Norman building, isn't it? That is an actual Norman building, yeah. That, this, the actual building dates, it's, it's 12th century. Um, there's there's an, a, a Norman 
uh, window there that did some, um, that, not actually original, but Norman style, because um, they just messed about with bits of it. Um, the water gate we saw earlier on, uh, that was a dwelling, they got, there's a garda road there in, in one corner, a uh, toilet. Um, the, yeah. Okay. Any, anybody else got a question? It's not going to be a question about shipping area. It wasn't that unusual, was it? Because if I remember rightly, most of um, most of Bugle Street was occupied by shipwrights. Yeah, um, and, and, yeah. And the, what we call the Duke of Wellington today used to be called the shipwrights' arms. Of course, yeah. Uh, and if you go through the Port Leap records, there's evidence of a number of the shipwrights um, coming up before the Port Leap because of leaving the, the quayside in a mess with their launches. So I suppose we shouldn't be too surprised that it was built there. But a phenomenal task. Yeah. But how do you build ships on tidal mudflats? There <laughs> I know I know how they used to clean them or if they repair them, they would wait for low tide and they would careen them so they would tip the ship over. And so at low tide they could, they could walk out on planks so they they could work on the ship. To actually build it, I think they had a purpose-built dock there. How they kept the water out, I'm not, I'm not sure. But yeah, they would have had to start with a from scratch. So I'm not here for Basically what I think what they think is pure speculation. So you get the, where the tide comes in, and basically you dig a hole inside the tide line. You dig a big hole below the water line of the ship. Basically, you build a ship in it, and then you just literally, when you finish, go and dig the last the dam out. So a dry dock. So effectively, you built a dry dock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was a mud dry dock. It wasn't mm -hmm. a, 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 a one we see today. But whenever I've dug holes in mud for laying anchors for boring lines and that, it fills up the water immediately. Yeah. Whether the tide's in or not. Yeah. And that was the reason for the big because they wouldn't repair that excavation. That was further down at um, God's House Tower. Oh, yeah, if you, um, if you actually, if you ever look at God's House Tower, you could actually see the remains or the, the bricked up part where, where the tunnel used to go underneath. Yeah, so it would, because it was uh, for me, yeah, it was for me at Ealing, wasn't it? Um, the, the canal cut, so it would have come down, and uh, that's what. Yeah, it was on, on the east side of the wall, outside the wall, on, on the east side. Yeah, right. And anybody else? Well, you, mentioned, you mentioned the Ferrari. Can you tell us something about the Ferrari? Yeah, the, the, um, the Ferrari that was, um, that was um, of course, dissolved by Henry VIII. Um, they, they were there. They were, they were um, the f people that brought in running water to Southampton. Mm -hmm. um, if any of you have seen the conduit house outside the Mayf or opposite the Mayflower yeah. Theatre, um, it pumped water down from the spring in Hill Lane, and they had pipes running all the, all the way into the town, um, and there was one or two conduit houses in, in the town. There was one, one near Holyrood Church. So the friars brought in fresh water to the town, um, they, they were friars and not monks, so they used to come out into the town and they did a lot of charity work. They, they ran God's House Tower, they, they, that, that, they ran the hospital at uh, God's House. Um, and uh, they, they were there for a few hundred years. Uh, when, when the monasteries were dissolved, they ended, um, I don't know how long the monastery, dis, the friary dis, um, lasted for, but I know they, they ended up with a, a sugar factory or sugar refinery on top of them. So um, I don't know uh, what happened to the uh, Ferrari building itself, but um, they built the um, British Telecom. Uh, it's not there anymore. It's, it's now um, the, the doctor's surgery has been rebuilt again. But uh, British Telecom built all over there, so they've, they've ex extensively ex ex excavated the whole area. Um, I mentioned before about um, William Soak being buried there, and there were several other graves. But there's uh, there's nothing left of it now because they've on the top of it. St Julian's Church, what uh, relationship is that to the Friary? Um, 
that was the um, the original medieval church was there before before the um, the Huguenots. It ended up as the French church eventually, um, but originally that was the um, church attached to the Frari there, um, dating back to the 1100s, so if, if I remember rightly. Um, the remains, of the, the 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 foundations are all 1100s, but the rest of it was rebuilt. I've, I've read a reference that was rebuilt in the early 1800s. So the church we see today is almost completely rebuilt, but that the original church was on that side. But it was the church for the Friary. That's right, yeah. This has been a relatively recent uh, archaeological dig on the Friary site, which should be written up by now. All right. That should be interesting, yeah. Because yeah, they've been doing a lot more work around there recently again, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. quite so. So I have wood ships, this is always fascinating to me, particularly as you were saying there, it wasn't just hope that you used to construct. Um, the, my family name comes from charcoal burners from the wheel of Sussex. And they, they were stopped from doing that because of course wood became such an important commodity for building ships for the defence of the realm. sorts of interwoven threads to stories like this, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You just remind me then actually about uh just talk about the wood. The um the grass dure, they, they there was some wood on there from, from the Baltics. Um there was there was Prussian wood and there was uh was it Russia or something, but there was there was other wood brought in from other places as well, in, imported from, from a long way away to build it as well. So that was a massive project. I have read that the visitors were taken to see it and were really impressed with it. I'm glad you said that because it's, it's prompting. I don't remember that there was a Sofa was a was a merchant. He had figures and all sorts of pies. Um, he ha, he had ties with Italian merchants, uh, Florentine merchants. Um, when there are aliens in the town, they had to be um, sponsored or they had to uh, you, you needed someone to stay with. So Sofa took in some of the aliens, the, the, the Fiorentine merchants, and they went to dine on the Grastur. He went to sh he showed them the Grastur, and it was one of the merchants who wrote a diary about his visit, so that's another reason we've got extensive uh, records of it. Um, just, what was, I'm just thinking of another thing as well, about the ownership of... Ah, oh, that's another thing, yes. Um, Soka was accused of being a pirate. One of his ships... Uh, that he, typically a, a, a merchant would be a third owner of a ship. You wouldn't, you wouldn't own a ship, you would spread your, spread your risk over several ships. One of the ships that he had a third share in um, captured the Holy Ghost in uh, the Saint Clair in Castile. Uh, a few years later, one of his barges with £500 worth of cargo on board was in Bilbao and it was impounded by, by the Spanish uh, the, the master of the ship was, the, 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 the agent was um, a Mr. Savage, and he was held for ransom. So that was their way of getting back on Soper, who'd, who'd stolen one of their ships years before. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I, I don't think, I'm, I'm trying to nudge, boy, nudge myself to remember some of the things I had there to... But I think I've, I've, I've covered the, 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 main, the main story of the grass dure, how it came about, why it was needed, what happened to it, and why it wasn't <coughs> needed in the end. Um, what I'd like, I'm, I'm going to do this again one day because I'll, while I'm doing my research, of course it opens up all sorts of other avenues, I want to find out where the, exactly where the hunting lodge was. I want to go and visit the um, um, Berry, I've forgotten, uh, I keep forgetting the name of it. Newton, Newton Berry. And there's several other places that are mentioned that I'd like to go and visit and, um, and uh, photograph. And, and also the exact position of the, of the tower down at Hamble. There's no, there's no um, evidence of, where the of the tower being there, but they know it was at the entrance to, uh, to the river there. Yeah, right. So I hope you've enjoyed what I did, what bit I did tonight. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't know why I got through it so quick because I hadn't, you know, 
I didn't want to overfill it with too much information, but, but on the other hand, yeah, I didn't want to finish too quickly, but there you go. Can I just ask yes. this, so if you go to Hamble, where can you see it? You, um, if you go to the Hamble, it's a Hamble Valley country park, isn't it, it's called? Um, um, on the roundabout, as you, as you go, um, if you're at the Tesco roundabout and you've got the, the roundabout that goes onto the motorway, the entrance to the... It's Itchin Valley, isn't it? No, Manor Farm. Farm. That's it, Manor Farm, yes. yeah. And you've got there the parent, because I've never actually been down to see it myself, but um, if you go into the country park there, you go down to a pathway and you have to walk down the pathway to, to um, get to it. So that's where it will be viewed. It's on the Burzelton side. Yeah, on the, on the Burzelton side, apparently. Yeah, yeah. 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 All you can see is a yellow boy in blue. Mm -hmm. So even at low tide? Uh, yeah, and unless you have at the right time. You have to look in the book, it's got to be lower than 0.3 of a metre. Because okay. yeah. when I showed the picture earlier on, there, there, yeah, you, you could great. see quite a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, from what I did read, they, they, they reckon this, you were talking about the sonar earlier on, the, the equipment that they used yeah. down at the NOC. Um, they, they reckon there's about one and a half metres sunk in the mud. Yes. So, was there a hazard to shipping that it was up there? <laughs> no, because where they cut the um, they cut the mud berth, so it was it was out of the way, so to speak, so that so they could still get the ships go by, and because they did have a, a, it was seventeen ships along there at one point. But was it the grass deer that um, someone, someone was telling me that uh, it was a sort of shopping law, it was a trident of its day, yeah. it was a huge vessel to. Yeah, for as a, as a, an anti-threat for any uh, powers that be in the rest of Europe, um, yeah, they wouldn't mess with, 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 with like that. But That's it. Yeah, it didn't, didn't have to be used. It was just there as a, a big statement. Yeah, yeah, because it, the, the French and Genoese had carrots, and they were they were smaller and faster. Because um, with this huge ship, it would be, <coughs> if you saw that coming, you know, you know, put, the, put the willies up here, I think, wouldn't it? Like to be a tourist attraction. Do you think that's the ultimate aim? Um, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, Brian was telling me. I learned they, they they do guided walks around there that I've just learned about. Um, they they the big thing at the moment uh, they're doing is the um, the virtual grass tour. They're, they're putting a computer program together where you can actually log, log onto an internet site mm. and it will show you the grass tour and then you can be able to fly around it. They're doing all this at the moment, so. Look out eventually for the virtual class tour at all. That, that was unveiled last weekend at the medieval weekend at the um, two day effort event. Yeah, it's all right here, yeah. But who owns the land that are on the Bozildon side? Because you can't get on that side as far as I know. No, I don't, I don't know about that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know. There's a public walk there. You can walk up there. It's actually a criminal offence to walk on the site for the grass deer. Yes. All oh, right, because it's all Although Southampton University paid a nominal one pound for it, because all this legal stuff attached to it. Yeah. It's, uh, something, something like a wall grader, right? it's, it's that sort of uh, illegal that attachment to the site. Right, yeah. So you can't go digging around to the public land with anything, you need to be crossing the land or something. It's incredibly great to be it's an equivalent to grade two listed building. It's something, yeah, grade two listed. Right. Uh, the grass tier was 200 feet long, I think it was. Um, do you know, I can't remember, but the Mary Rose is bigger, I think, wasn't it? Well, it would be, because that was the biggest tier. No. Twice the size of the Mary Oh, right. I, I did read that Grasture was the size of the Victory, yeah. but the Mary Rose was, was smaller than that. I, I didn't know about the Mary Rose size. No. Yeah. And, any more questions? No? Right, I'll, think I'll wrap it up there then. And thank you all for coming. And thank you for enjoying it. That is the very first time I've ever done a talk in my entire life. <laughs> I'm going to drink it off. Yeah, I'll just try to keep it.